All right, 107, we're, we're ratcheting up very quickly here with attendees and the chat function is live. Please say hi in the chat, where you're coming from and uh, we're going to get started at 7 p.m. So as we're ratcheting up here and uh, we're saying hi to everybody, uh, please make sure your chat is, is open and as questions arise, I'll be moderating tonight and uh, yeah, after each talk, we will ask the panelists some questions and then we'll move on to the next. And if you'd like to stay on, I'm Mauricio from Colombia. That's cool, but go to Colombia. Um, and as we finish up around eight o'clock, we'll have an extended Q and A for, for questions that are coming through on the chat. And I'll be active the entire evening, uh, guiding this uh, great talk with some, some excellent speakers. So leading us off tonight is somebody who has worked with me for almost a decade now as an athletic trainer and physician extender, orthopedic physician assistant. She runs much of the administrative functions of our practice, interacts with the schools, and helps to coordinate return to play, return to school for not only our student athletes, but also employees, teachers, nurses, et cetera. Uh, she's got ext extensive experience, uh, especially over the past eight months with coordinating these policies and procedures for the schools in terms of COVID and uh, precautions. So she's going to lead us off with some practical approaches for schools and, and teams in terms of return to play, screening, etc. cetera. Uh, welcome everybody and uh, here's Andrea Happel. Hello, just going to pull out my screen here. All right, so um, just to get started, I'm gonna go over some um, recommendations and updates. So um, objectives, we're just gonna cover kind of the basics of what is SARS, um, coronavirus 2, when did it start, define some terms. Um, we're going to then kind of focus most of this talk on um, testing, where we're at now, and kind of tips for return to safe um, school and sports. So what is SARS coronavirus 2? Um, Bat-borne virus that began in China in 2019. Spread the globe rapidly and became a pandemic. So um, just to define some terms, asymptomatic carrier. So um, someone who's infected with SARS um, coronavirus 2 but does not develop the signs and symptoms. Um, however, this person can spread the virus to others. So Dr. Fauci came out um, about two weeks ago saying that the latest development shows that 40 to 45% of um, infectious carriers are asymptomatic. Um, so that is a large proportion of um, the disease that's being spread or is coming from those asymptomatic carriers. Um, infection, uh, incuba uh, incubation period, so this is the time that someone is infected until the symptoms appear. So anywhere between two and 14 days um, after they've been infected, will they have symptoms if they're going to have the symptoms? Um, the infectious period is from two days prior to the start of symptoms until about 10 days after um, their symptoms um, onset. So, so common signs and symptoms, basics that we've all heard here. Just a little refresher of fever greater than 100.4, um, fatigue, muscle pain, difficulty breathing, um, loss of taste or smell. So here's where symptoms can kind of become tricky. Um, there's nonspecific symptoms, which are um, common in not only COVID-19, but also in some other um, cold, flu, and even allergies. So as we're coming on cold and flu season, um, these different symptoms are definitely important to kind of keep an eye on. So then you have specific symptoms as well, um, such as loss, or loss of taste or smell that are more specific just to COVID-19. Um, this is your reminder to get your flu shot. Um, so some progressive signs and symptoms, um, obviously worsening fevers, blue face or lips, meaning you're not getting enough oxygen, difficulty breathing, things like that. These are all symptoms that you should seek immediate care for. 
So just to talk a little bit about risk factors, um, how the disease kills and some conditions. So risk factors are not necessarily our athletes and our students. Um, they're 65 and older. They're also um, obese. There are people that, um, condition, that have conditions that increase your severity, such as diabetes, hypertension, um, different things like that. So again, not really aiming at most of our children. However, don't forget that as your children go out and play sports and go to school and all of those things, they're bringing any germs that they're picking up home to you, grandparents, all their other loved ones. Um, so the disease is not actually killing you itself by the disease. The disease is uh, making it so your lungs are having a hard time breathing. Um, you're not able to get in enough oxygen. And then obviously no treatment. So um, basically what we can do is to help support the body's function um, while you keep fighting off the disease by your immune system. All right, so transmission of the disease. The main point that I'm making here um, is that the droplets can travel at six feet when stationary. So if a kid is sitting at their desk, six feet is how far droplets from a sneeze or a cough are able to travel. However, when a person is running on a field or you know playing a contact sport and breathing heavier, their droplets are obviously going farther. Um, so transmission is the greatest from physical contact. Um, when you're in close contact, so uh, closer than six feet for greater than 15 minutes, um, shared environments, shared food, and congregate housing, such as dormitories. So how to reduce transmission. These are obvious. Um, do not touch your face. You've probably heard these a million times. Cover your cough or sneeze. Wash your hands regularly. Wear a mask. Stay home when you're sick. Um, one of the newer um, things that have come out is that gators have been approved from high school athletics. Um, the, Nas the National Federation of High School Associations um, has made the modification for one year um, that gators are allowed. However, they will be, um, calls will be made on the fact that, you know, they can't use them as like a horse collar and things like that. So to talk a little bit about wearing masks, as it is controversial in many parts of um, the country still. Um, obviously, it's said to wear them, but a lot of people are um, kind of resisting. But pre-COVID, um, from the Clinical Infectious Disease uh, Journal, they did a study where basically masks, whether it was a surgical mask or an N95, was actually um, equally effective in preventing the spread of the PCR um, detected influenza. So some things that are not proven um, to reduce transmission, and again, this is in the general public. So um, gloves, wash your hands. Um, you know, you can definitely use gloves, but you have to remember that they are for single use things as well. And the whole touching something at the grocery store and then touching your face, the, there's no point in them um, in that scenario. So the same thing with face shields and goggles, um, definitely for the general public, not necessarily even recommended as far as if you are working in a hospital or something like that with patients who are intubated or have any expectorants, um, then those would definitely be helpful. Um, and again, the biggest thing that, you know, even on airplanes and things like that, they're saying masks with valves or vents, they're not even allowed. Um, so basically you're just pushing out your air so all of your germs are going out as well. You're just not able to get it in. They definitely are easier to breathe in, um, but definitely not recommended because they're defeating the purpose. Um, all right, so a little on contact tracing. Um, our biggest thing is that, you know, one case of COVID can have a long-term um, impact. So if we can reduce that, we're reducing the overall total number of cases. So when someone shows symptoms, it's super important, obviously, to act as fast as possible to kind of change the behavior of all of their contacts. Um, kind of back to Dr. Fauci's article regarding the 40 to 45% of asymptomatic carriers. So contact tracing has been made difficult by that as well. With so many asymptomatic carriers, it is difficult to um, make sure you're finding all of 
the possible contacts. Um, all right, back to defining a few more terms. So basically a case, someone who's been exposed um, to COVID-19 uh, contact is someone who has been exposed to a case while infectious. Um, so again, that's you know two days prior to illness in the case. Um, isolation is where you wanna keep yourself separate from everyone, everything. They re recommend staying in own, your own bedroom, those kind of things. And then quarantine is where you restrict yourself from kind of seeing other people for 14 days. So really quick, I think everyone pretty much knows the basics of testing. There's the, piece, uh, there's the diagnostic testing and then there's the antibody testing. Um, huge disclaimer that no test is 100% accurate. However, they are getting better um, since testing all began. So um, the CDC revised um, the asymptomatic testing guideline. So they've kind of gone back and forth, but as of September 18th, so last week, they have said that basically anyone that was exposed to someone with COVID-19 should get a test. Um, if you were in close contact, especially, which again, close contact, the definition is six feet for at least 15 minutes. Um, so again, even if you don't have symptoms, you should be getting a test. So um, the New Jersey Department of Health and New Jersey Communicable Disease Services have put out this nice graph as far as um, if you get tested or even, um, yeah, if you get tested, whether you're symptomatic or not, um, what your time frame for either quarantine or isolation is. Um, basically, there's a lot of, um, you know, quarantine, it's, they're kind of playing it better safe than sorry here. Um, all right, so this is where we're going to spend most of our time um, on tips of returning to school and sport. So obvious, again, we've all heard these before, you know, wear a mask, physical distance, wash your hands, stay home when you're not feeling well, um, use of a screening tool. Um, I know that some districts are using it, some are not. And same thing with um, temporal temperature checks. So the biggest thing I think is that districts should have a plan to remain fluid. Um, things can change at any minute. So essentially, you know, have a plan, a backup plan to go virtual. And that goes for parents as well. Um, you know, if all of a sudden there's a breakout at the school, you're gonna end up virtual and kind of back to where we were in March. Um, so some different things um, also would be cleaning and disinfecting. Um, the CDC has put out guidelines um, regarding how often um, basically um, commonly touched surfaces should be disinfected and cleaned um, common areas. They've also recommended, um, which I'm not certain, I haven't heard any of um, the schools that we interact with um, are doing this, but they've also recommended that the teachers are actually switching classrooms versus the students. However, if the students are going to switch classrooms, then they're talking about, um, you know, putting some arrows in the hallways to kind of keep it from commingling and just kind of keep kids moving, um, kind of like they did in the grocery stores originally. Um, so the other thing would be, well, the other thing regarding this was, um, is buses. So um, I know a lot of kids bus to school. So the idea is definitely make sure your kids are wearing a mask. They've, you know, they've recommended that the buses run on an emptier um, schedule, so less kids per bus. Um, they've also recommended that if you have another way to get your children to school um, versus sending them on the bus, definitely try to do that. So um, tips for returning to sport, again, all of the same things. Um, bring your own water, bring your own towel are kind of added to this, avoid shared equipment, things like that. Um, I know for um, the schools that we interact with, they are using different um, screening tools. Most of our schools are on um, Sway Medical. They have come out with a um, COVID screening tool where every day the kid will get a notification and um, will have to fill out yes, no's to all the different symptoms and then put a temperature in there. Um, so in the state of New Jersey, most of our schools are up and running, however, uh, or for football. Um, so however, many are slowly beginning to kind of close down. 
um, you know, a bunch of different districts have actually postponed, you know, their first week and things like that. However, New York City school districts have postponed their semester to, or their, I'm sorry, not semester, their fall football schedule to begin in March. Um, again, on this, there's different um, cleaning um, recommendations um, all by the CDC. They've put out different products to use and um, schedules, things like that. Um, as far as buses, every district is a little bit different. Some districts are not using busing at all. Others are coming down to 11 um, people on a 56 person bus. Um, and obviously masks are required. So another big thing to think about and to remind your children, your athletes, um, is to keep your mouth guards in your mouth. That's where a lot of um, germs are being passed around, how they kind of bite on them and things like that. So um, a big thing would be to keep the mouth guard in the mouth. And then um, as far as spectators at games, um, I think every school is different. Some are just doing live recordings. Some are allowing you know, tickets for parents, like two tickets per athlete kind of thing. Um, so again, I think the biggest thing is just that you know, each district has a plan, um, not only with your state and local um, health departments, but also with your district physicians. Um, make sure your superintendent, your athletic trainers, your nurses, and everyone's on board with the same plan going forward. Um, and then some references and thank you. That was great, Andrea, and um, very practical information and hopefully useful for everybody. And congratulations on your wedding. That last photo there, Andrea was recently married. So a big congratulations there. Um, the questions that are coming through right now are, are, are some basic questions, not necessarily specifically uh, in, in relation except for one. When the gator is wet, where the mask is wet for athletes who are participating in practice, does that diminish their efficacy? And I, my answer is, is no, because we're gonna continue to have decreased droplet transmission. Um, and so, you know, the, the idea that the, the wet mask might not work as well if it's breaking down or if the fabric is loosened, you know, that, that could be true. But we're gonna also post some educational materials uh, with the uh, later uh, presentation recording, and we'll verify exactly uh, that the answer to that question to be 100% sure. Uh, please continue to use the chat, and uh, let's welcome next Dr. David Engel, who is the sports uh, uh, cardiologist with, with uh, Columbia uh, University Medical Center, and also has written a bunch of papers on structure and function of cardiac uh, in WNBA and NBA players and has uh, recently helped us understand the ACC guidelines regarding return to play, which is a rapidly developing uh, field of study. We, we've learned quite a bit as we've gone along, and he's going to help us to understand what our actual and perceived risks of myocarditis post-COVID might be and how best to approach those. So welcome, Dr. Engel, and thanks for spending the time with us. Great. Well, th thanks, and it's a pleasure to, to talk to everybody. And uh, like Dr. Battiglieri said, I'm going to talk about um, you know, COVID-19 and the heart, specifically as it relates to uh, return to play for athletes. Um, this has been a really busy time for sports cardiologists uh, because of the uncertainties uh, that uh, currently exist about the, the true effects of COVID-19 on the heart. And as way of background, we are discovering that there is a relationship between COVID-19 and the heart from our uh, data collection and observations of uh, hospitalized and critically ill patients um, with, with COVID-19. And what's been observed is that there's a higher prevalence of cardiac injury, uh, such as myocarditis, troponin elevation, new EKG, or echo abnormalities with COVID-19 in comparison with other viruses. Um, you know, the incidence can be up to 20% in your, in your critically ill and hospitalized patients. And again, higher than what we've observed with, with other serious viral illnesses. Um, what is not known, um, and you know, it's, it's you know, continual study currently about uh, the, the status of this question is whether there could be subclinical uh, cardiac injury in those people with less severe forms of, of COVID-19 disease. 
for example, those, those patients who have just mild forms of COVID-19 illness, like, like with the symptoms that Andrea was describing, or people who are asymptomatic, who have no discernible viral symptoms, who test positive uh, for the virus. You know, we don't know in that, in that patient population if there is subclinical myocarditis. And this question has particular relevance to athletes because myocarditis in the pre-COVID area accounts for five, approximately 5% 5 of cases of exercise triggered sudden cardiac death. So it's a, it's a prominent cause uh, of cardiac emergencies uh, in athletes. And the reason is, is that exercise and adrenaline and catecholamines can, can uh, trigger ventricular, potentially uh, trigger ventricular arrhythmias if there's scar tissue or, or inflammation of the heart. So, you know, a lot of attention is being paid currently to how to best screen athletes for this potential an unknown illness. So we're, we're trying to even, you know, screen for a, a disease that we don't even know exists. However, over this summer, there has been some, some small data uh, published uh, about myocarditis and people with, with mild forms of disease, and it's gotten a lot of media attention. And I'll just briefly just discuss this. Um, there's been a lot of attention and also a lot of critique about about what's been been published and how it's been uh, how it's been um, you know advertised um, there were there were two studies really that I want to talk about the first was a, a study of in JAMA cardiology in July where a group in Germany looked at about a hundred patients who had recovered from COVID illness some were sick in the hospital some had mild illness and some were asymptomatic and they performed cardiac MRIs on these patients um, about two or three months after they recovered from their illness. And they reported a very high incidence of what they, what they called myocarditis in, in these 100 patients. Approximately 70% had some evidence of myocardial inflammation that they attributed to the virus. So that's, a, that's an enormous you know, percentage of uh, of, of patients. And, then, and again, this occurred in the asymptomatic patients, the hospitalized patients, and in, in the, the patients who had just mild illness. They defined myocarditis by very subtle MRI techniques. There was some, you know, an extension of a T2 time and some late gadolinium enhancement where there saw patches of inflammation in the heart. And while it, again, it did get a lot of attention that there was some sort of cardiac change. The, the degree of this change, I think, was overstated. And, and again, this has received a lot of attention in the sports cardiology world because we don't know if these kinds of changes exist with other forms of virus like the flu or with influenza. You know, maybe with other forms of a virus, you might see some of these subtle MRI changes. Um, and again, these these patients had no cardiac symptoms. They weren't short of breath. They didn't have heart muscle dysfunction. You know, their, their cardiac functioning was normal and they didn't have any other signs of, of cardiac injury. Um, so, and they, are, they had a control group of, of patients as well who also had some changes, uh, again, surprisingly high amounts of changes using these very subtle techniques. So the true difference between COVID-19 injury and, and, and control was not, not very big, but that, that part of the study wasn't highlighted very much, but it made people very nervous about the you know, potential involvement of the heart. The second study was published just a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, where uh, a group of, of Big Ten you know, coll collegiate athletes, there were 26 who received a cardiac MRI uh, a, few a few weeks after their COVID illness. And none of these patients were very sick with COVID. They, they all had fairly mild, mild COVID illness. And four out of the 26, again, had shown some sort of myocardial inflammation uh, based on these MRI criteria. Again, all of these, all of these uh, athletes had no signs of cardiac symptoms. They had no evidence of heart muscle dysfunction. The ejection fractions were normal. Their EKGs were normal. In fact, blood tests that looked for myocarditis were also negative. So their troponins were negative. So the, the 
really how to interpret these MRI findings is very difficult um, when, you're, when you're kind of putting it out of context. And there's a lot of, again, critique about the, the, the significance of the study because using these criteria you know, by MRI to define myocarditis really should be placed into context uh, for, for clinical signs of the disease. Again, symptoms, left ventricular dysfunction, uh, fever, inflammatory markers that are being elevated. So none of these were present in these athletes. But again, a lot of attention was paid uh, to the studies and it's created a lot of uncertainty and concern uh, for all you know, uh, healthcare providers who take care of athletes and want to provide a safe uh, sort of screening process for their athletes to return to play. Um, I, I work very closely with the ACC Sports and Exercise Cardiology Council and been involved with the formation of our preliminary sort of return to play algorithm, which I'm going to present. Again, the algorithm was, was designed to deliberately be conservative because we really don't know the significance uh, of, of COVID-19 in, 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 in for athletes. But uh, so what the ACC Sports and Exercise Cardiology Council recommended was um, a series of tests. And I'm gonna show my, my slides here, um, which, which I'm presenting here is the ACC preliminary and interim return to play uh, algorithm for, for athletes who have tested positive uh, for COVID-19. And symptom burden was a major uh, sort of starting point in, in, in the decision making on how you should screen at the time for the time being. So on the left are, are for people who are asymptomatic, for athletes who are asymptomatic, meaning that they either test positive for the antibody um, without known symptoms that preceded uh, any viral symptoms, or they test positive via PCR or nose swab, but again, they had no symptoms. Um, what, what the ACC is currently recommending is that if they, after their positive test, or specifically after a positive PCR test, which is felt to be a more active form of disease, the athlete should rest for two weeks without, without training. Um, and if the athlete remains without any symptoms um, that are concerning for, for for a cardiac issue, then no additional testing is recommended and they can return to play in a graded fashion, meaning they should, they should ramp up their, their exercise uh, in a gradual form. So um, this differs for, for any athlete who's actually had symptoms, whether they have mild symptoms, like even loss of smell or taste, or if they've had fevers or nasal congestion, or, or you know, going all the way to, towards hospitalization, um, these people should undergo screening. And, um, and, and again, if they're COVID positive, and they should first rest with no exercise, you know, while they're having symptoms and for a minimum of two weeks after symptom resolution. So a two week rest period after their symptoms re resolve. And then each athlete at the present time is recommended to undergo a blood test for a high sensitivity troponin. Uh, if the troponin high sensitivity is not available, um, then um, you know troponin I or troponin T is acceptable. An ECG and a resting echocardiogram, not a stress echo, but a resting echocardiogram prior to resumption of full training. If those three screening tests are normal, then we would allow them to return to play again in a graded fashion, not to return you know, and, and be at 110% right off the bat, but to, to return in a graded fashion. If there are abnormalities on these screening tests, whether there's a troponin elevation or an EKG that, that seems abnormal or, or, or abnormal findings on an echo, then they need a full cardiology evaluation, which will lo likely include a cardiac MRI um, and stress tests and other, and other testing that's you know, deemed necessary by the sports cardiologist. And if there is signs of myocarditis, then they should be held out according to ACC HA guidelines, which is usually um, three to six months. 
So it's a very serious uh, issue if an athlete has, you know, active myocarditis, that they, they do need to be held out. Um, so with this algorithm, the professional leagues um, and, you know, numerous colleges, you know, colleges that I'm working with and consulting with uh, have been performing this testing algorithm. And, um, you know, despite what, what we've, again, I talked about briefly with the MRI studies, what our real observations are is that the incidence of actual myocarditis, anything that we can detect clinically, fortunately has been exceptionally low. So the NCAA is collecting a registry of all uh, collegiate athletes to help sort of, you know, you know put, you know, you know, formalize this data. And in addition, the professional leagues that I'm involved with this project, we're starting to uh, pool and, and hopefully we'll be able to present our, uh, our findings in, in a few months of, of the results of this, of this um, you know, cardiac screening process. But the, the general sense uh, for, for between myself and all the sports, sports cardiologists that I work with around the country is that fortunately we're seeing a very low incidence of myocarditis. Not zero, but, but, ex but exceptionally low. So we're able, we feel comfortable uh, allowing athletes who've had prior symptoms um, returning to play if, if they're, this series of testing um, you know, has, been, has been normal. Uh, in fact, you know, the ACC is going to likely revise the screening process you know, over time, again, as we gain more experience um, and uh, sort of learn more about the data and probably scale back some of these recommendations. But I don't recommend scaling back at this time until we know more and let the NCAA, let the professional leagues, let, let us you know, accumulate the data so that we can you know, make better informed decisions. And I wanted to show a few real life examples of um, results of some screening processes where in the column on the right, where, where abnormal test results came up and, and how we, we handle those. So, so on this slide are, are four, four athletes where, again, there were some abnormalities on their initial testing. Uh, if we look at athlete one, who's a 20 year old basketball player, um, he, had, he had prior viral symptoms. Uh, he was tested positive for COVID by a PCR. And after two weeks of rest, he came in for his cardiac testing. His troponin was mildly elevated. It was just above the 99th percentile. His EKG looked normal and there were no abnormalities on his echo. He was referred for a cardiac MRI that was normal. It had normal LV ejection fraction. There was no late gadolinium enhancement or any other form of myocarditis. In addition, the sports cardiologist uh, also recommended a stress echo, which showed normal augmentation with exercise and no exercise induced arrhythmias. And this athlete was allowed to play. He was, he was allowed to return to play. Um, athlete two was a football player. Uh, he had symptoms, PCR positive. His troponin was normal. His ECG looked normal. But on his echo, his, his LV ejection fraction was mildly reduced or, or on the low normal side. And actually he had a previous echo again that we were able to compare with that looked a little bit different. But because the troponin was normal, um, he was not referred for an MRI, but just a, a stress echo, uh, which showed normal augmentation with exercise, no exercise induced arrhythmias, and he was um, allowed to play. Um, the, the athlete three was a, was a female basketball player. She had no symptoms whatsoever. Um, her, she tested positive, you know, by antibody, but again, had no discernible viral symptoms. Her troponin and ECG were normal, but again, her echo showed mildly reduced ejection fraction. Her, her ejection fraction was not borderline, it was actually mildly reduced. And in this setting, we obtained a cardiac MRI, which showed low normal EF, no late gadolinium enhancement or any other form of MRI myocarditis. And the stress showed normal augmentation 
and no exercise induced arrhythmia, so she was allowed to return to the play. Um, athlete four, however, was a different scenario. He had a 22-year-old soccer player. Uh, he had prior symptoms and a positive PCR test. His troponin was, was mildly uh, positive. You know, it wasn't a very dramatic elevation, but it was above the 99th percentile. And the echo showed low normal ejection fraction. He was sent for an MRI, which also showed low normal ejection fraction. But he did have late gadolinium enhancement and some of the other uh, features of, uh, of cardiac, um, uh, of myocarditis by cardiac MRI. And he was held out uh, because we felt you know, between the abnormal troponin, and the abnormal echo and the MRI, that there was enough evidence here to demonstrate two true myocarditis. And he's been held out you know, for a period of six months. So when you're, when you're performing this, this screening testing, it is very important to have cardiac, cardiology oversight, so ideally with, with a sports cardiologist, because some of these decision makings can be very tricky. And obviously, the implications are enormous uh, to hold someone out you know, for a period of three or six months. Most of the time, that's the whole season for someone. And it can be you know, devastating for the athletes, uh, you know, for their happiness and for their career. So we need to be very careful and judicious about how we interpret these testing and, and who we're testing. You know, right now, the ACC does not recommend you know, just going out and getting an MRI on everybody because we may see things that we don't know exactly how to interpret. So this stepwise approach you know, is very important. So again, it's an evolving area, you know, a busy time for sports cardiologists, but again, I hope this kind of review has been helpful. That's, that's a great talk, David, and, and thank you so much for, for clarifying these issues. We have a bunch of questions and we're a little over on time, so we're gonna get those done in the post-webinar extended chat. So we have four great questions from, from Ariel, Jennifer, and, uh, and, and, and more uh, that we will get to at the, uh, the, the post-webinar extended um, Q&A. So great job, David, and, and I think if anything, what, what uh, really the message is being conveyed, the evidence is growing, it's mounting, we're taking a clinical approach to testing, we're looking for reasons to test, and um, Dr. Engel is going to work on his audio. We had a little bit of a breakup right at the end there. So we're just going to make sure the connection is great. So in the Q&A, Q &A we'll, be, we'll be ready to roll. Um, I'm looking up at the attendees. We have so many uh, friends and, and uh, people we work with every day that have joined. Thank you all for being here. RC and Vanessa, Amanda, Dave, uh, Allison, Cindy, thanks so much for joining. We're up over 250 live attendees who are participating in the chat. Please use the chat function and not the Q&A because we're going to be live uh, answer. I'm going to answer those questions live and collate the questions for the extended Q&A at the end. Uh, thanks again, Dave. Next up is uh, Morgan Busco, who is an internist and specialist in sports medicine in our group. She's also an accomplished triathlete herself. She has a special interest in endurance medicine uh, in terms of athletes who are participating with marathons, triathlons, and other uh, endurance events. Uh, Morgan is going to talk to us tonight about return to play protocols. And uh, there's been a bunch of questions in the chat so far about how we will return in a graduated fashion. So that's part of what Dr. Busco is going to cover now. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time, Morgan, and uh, welcome. All right, thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some pulmonary concerns and how we should address activity ramp up after a COVID infection. Uh, so just briefly, we'll talk about basics of the lung anatomy, how SARS-CoV-2 affects the lungs, uh, potential long-term pulmonary complications of COVID, uh, what might be involved in a pulmonary workup after a COVID infection, returning to exercise after COVID-19, and just general deconditioning guidelines and awareness around this. Um, so I just want to start for two minutes here looking at uh, lung physiology, because I think it is important for us to understand, um, given that the lower respiratory tract is the most heavily involved organ of the body with a COVID infection, um, what, what that looks like and how COVID affects your lungs. Um, so I like to think of the lungs as a tree and the trachea is like the trunk of the tree and then it branches off into the bronchus and the bronchioles. And at the end of all the bronchioles, all the branches of the tree, you have the alveoli. And the alveoli are uh, immensely important for us in terms of exchanging 
oxygen and carbon dioxide. And uh, you actually have 600 million of these alveoli at the end of your tree branches. So um, they're very, very, very tiny sacs. If you look here, this is just a cartoon picture of what a healthy alveolus would look like. Um, and it's just a small sac, a fairly thin wall that has a blood vessel surrounding it. So each of these has a blood vessel. Uh, fun fact, if you spread them out, all 600 million, they would fill an entire tennis court. Um, so it's a large surface area of exchange where this blood vessel allows you to uh, assimilate the oxygen through that your airway has brought in and exchange it for carbon dioxide that you breathe out. And that is what then goes to oxygenate your whole body. Um, so obviously very important for uh, organ oxygenation and when we're thinking about athletes, you know, the muscles rely on this, um, particularly during heavy exercise. Uh, so then we'll jump to looking at how SARS-CoV-2 affects the lungs. And here we see the healthy alveolus again. Um, and unfortunately, when we get COVID, what happens is the virus basically hijacks the cells of the alveolus. And um, it basically reprograms them to replicate the coronavirus instead of the host cells that it's uh, used to replicating. And that then causes what could be a, a local form of pneumonia in the lung, and it really impairs the oxygen exchange in that one particular area. Um, and then as the virus progresses, our immune system kicks in which is normally a good thing, but uh, what we're seeing more and more with COVID is that it's actually leading to worsening respiratory symptoms. And the way that happens is that the uh, immune system actually tries to dilate that vessel around the alveolus. And that allows for more immune cells to come in to try to protect the lung and defeat the virus. Uh, but unfortunately, by dilating that blood vessel, it's allowing a lot of fluid to seep in. And so when you look at kind of the moderate and severe cartoons here, we're seeing that because of all those extra immune cells and extra uh, proteins and you know these proteins that are called cytokines, which the body doesn't love, um, that little alveolus ends up filling with fluid. And that fluid is really bad because then it can't exchange oxygen at all. Um, and what ultimately happens is that alveolus will collapse and more will collapse. And once you have collapse of enough, um, you, you end up getting what we call this acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is what um, is the number one reason that people are being hospitalized and ventilated with uh, COVID-19. Um, so then when it becomes severe enough, the inflammation goes through the bloodstream and affects all the other organs. Um, but primarily the first, first and most important organ that's affected is the lower respiratory tract. And that's what leaves us unable to exchange oxygen. We, you, know, we, you hear people becoming hypoxic, checking their oxygen levels, and they're you know, at 80% instead of you know, somewhere upwards in the high 90s, which is what we want. Um, and it leads to that feeling of shortness of breath. Um, so when we're thinking about the potential long-term pulmonary effects of COVID, you know, Dr. Engel just gave us all the amazing um, knowledge that he has about uh, cardiology and all the studies that he's doing. And um, a lot of the takeaways are that we don't have all the answers yet because long-term for us right now is, is six months. And so we can't say that somebody three years down the line is going to have um, any resulting pulmonary complications. But um, I think it's important to know two things, and one is that most athletes will recover from COVID and not have any pulmonary long-term complications. Um, and the second is that as athletes, you know, despite the fact that we feel like, you know, we as athletes or our athletes or those we're taking care of are very fit and conditioned, uh, we're not immune to not only COVID, but we're not immune to the long-term pulmonary effects. Um, and so just a couple things I want to touch on is that uh, we're finding that at least within the near short term of even months after the infection. Um, some athletes are trying to return to sport and they're having difficulty breathing and maybe the cardiac workup is totally normal and there's no sense of myocarditis, but we're finding that on you know, pulmonary function tests that they have limited lung capacity compared to prior to the illness. Um, we're seeing poor conditioning due to the, this limited lung capacity um, and or other organ dysfunction. And then a little more uh, progressed and complicated is is getting scarring and fibrosis in the lung in regions that were highly damaged due to the acute illness. Um, and that's some pictures over here we see in figure A. Um, one of these studies looked at what the acute infection looked like, and that was these kind of areas in the base of the lung where we had some ground glass opacities that were consistent with an acute infection. And then uh, two or three months later, they become these regions of scarring and fibrosis in the lung which is not great because the, the fibrosis in, in those alveoli is basically like a hard wall that does not allow the exchange of oxygen in those areas. 
Um, so certainly something we want to avoid. It limits the lung elasticity, the function. Um, and we've already found, there's already some studies that have shown that some of this fibrosis has been um, starting to recover in some cases, but it's gonna take you know, many more years of studying recovered COVID cases to determine the long-term long effects. Um, and then lastly, just thinking about um, COVID as being a hypercoagulable state, meaning we are more inclined to get things like deep vein thromboses and pulmonary emboli. So anybody who has shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, particularly pain that, that worsens with inspiration, even at rest, um, certainly needs to be worked up for both pulmonary and cardiac complications. So when we're talking about a workup, um, the majority of COVID positive athletes will not require additional pulmonary testing. So unlike the cardiac standpoint, we are not recommending just a slew of pulmonary tests for every athlete just because they have had COVID. Um, that is largely because the cardiac complications can lead to sudden cardiac death, whereas uh, the pulmonary complications, they may be more subtle and a little more nuanced, but um, they're not likely to lead to a sudden death unless it is a pulmonary embolism. Um, so testing that may be considered, this is very individualized, um, so it's not like every athlete is getting you know, these six tests, but would be a chest x-ray, spirometry, pulmonary function test, um, a D-dimer, which is uh, what can be elevated if you do have a DVD or a pulmonary embolus, and a chest CT scan, which is what I showed in the last slide that showed those areas of fibrosis. Um, so Dr. Engel actually already talked about uh, most of these scenarios. This is just written out if you want to um, take a quick picture of this, but I won't go through it again since he, this is all uh, cardiac related. I'm just returning to play. Um, so when we're thinking about deconditioning awareness, we have to keep in mind that the reversibility principle of training, which is very basic, but it's basically that any inactivity or detraining can result in a return to baseline with a loss of all your previous training adaptation. So this is like the lose it, use it or lose it principle. Um, and unfortunately, it takes us a lot longer to create training adaptations and um, strengthen our muscles and increase our VO2 max than it does to lose it. So in a very short period of time, um, we can return to our baseline level of fitness or lose all the fitness that we've gained. And that could be due to a COVID illness, could be an injury, lack of motivation, or a planned off season. You know, most athletes do have a period of one or two months where they lose a lot of their conditioning only to build it back up. Um, and so we have to think of COVID like that because we are shutting these athletes down for a minimum of two weeks. And you know, most most athletes are not used to taking two weeks of inactivity ever. You know, most people are at least um, doing some form of light activity. And so we think of it as, you know, like a hospitalized patient who comes out very deconditioned even after just a few days. Um, and they cannot, even if they were completely asymptomatic, uh, they can't just return to sport like, like they would um, after, you know, being out with a, a runny nose for two or three days. So athletes, coaches, parents, weekend warriors, everyone should really be aware of the rapid deconditioning that can occur, particularly uh, the longer that the athlete is out. And that's what leads me to rule number one, two, and three in returning to COVID after exercise, and that is listening to your body. So every athlete is different. It is extremely hard for us to give blanket guidelines on um, you know, what can athletes do on day one when they're coming back day two, because it's all dependent on where they were to start, what sport they were doing, how active they were, and how they're feeling in returning. Um, and so I'll, I'll address just kind of heart rate zones and thinking about how much you're pushing your body because this is what's really pushing your cardiovascular system. But it's certainly not, uh, I can't give general guidelines on you know, every single sport and every athlete. And I think we're gonna go through a couple of cases that might give you more guidance. Um, so this is kind of a funny little chart of heart rate zones because most people have a hard time understanding what each zone means. Um, so zone one, when you're getting back into activity, you're going to be doing zone one, which is only going 50 to 60% of your max heart rate. And if you don't know your max heart rate, the simple, uh, not perfect way, but simple way of figuring it out is to do 220 minus your age. So if you were 40, your max heart rate would be somewhere around 180. Um, very individualized, so uh, you could certainly be higher or lower than that, but that's a general way of thinking about it. And you know, when you're first starting to exercise, you would not want to push out of zone one. 
So you'd want to be sure that you're feeling okay in that zone for at least a week or so. Um, progress to zone two, 60, 70%, zone three, zone four, zone five. And it's going to, you know, anybody who is uh, certainly having any symptoms or struggling or, or wondering how they should be progressing back should be consulting with a physician, and that could be, you know, one of our us as sports medicine physicians. It could be your primary care doctor if they feel comfortable um, progressing you back into athletics. Um, it could certainly be your cardiologist or pulmonologist if you're seeing someone. But um, just be sure that whoever you are consulting with is is aware of the most recent evidence and and feels comfortable um, guiding you back. Um, and then just a few other things when we're talking about deconditioning is, um, and this is important for athletic trainers and coaches is to be aware of the various injuries that are more likely to happen when our athletes have not been in sport for a, a while. And so those are things like stress fractures, um, overuse injuries like our, our tendonitis, and even ACL injuries, because we know that you know when athletes are not partaking in normal strengthening routines, they're more likely to tear an ACL or a, you know, ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow. And I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, we're protecting the athletes by progressing them back in slowly. Um, so listen to their body, uh, be open with your coaches and those around you and just uh, kind of be gentle in the return because this is unlike most other illnesses we have dealt with. Um, and that's it. I think we'll go through a couple cases as well after Dr. Ahmad. Awesome. Thanks so much, Morgan. The question that was asked that might pertain to one of the slides and, and what you just spoke about was the uh, waiting period post positive screen or post infection. Mm -hmm. And why are we waiting? What, what's happening during those first 10 to 14 days? Yeah, that's a great question. So even if you are asymptomatic and you test positive, this is hard for most people to grasp. Um, it's like you're sitting at home feeling totally normal and you get tested because you traveled somewhere or you had an exposure and you test positive, um, it's very hard, it would, it would be very hard for me to say to myself, okay, I'm not gonna exercise because I just tested positive. Um, you know, I feel good, I don't have any symptoms. So two reasons, one is that uh, for the next 14 days you may develop symptoms. And so if you're in that early stage, by stressing your body, you are, you're putting yourself more at risk to develop a more severe infection uh, and whatnot by, by exercising and stressing your body. And two is that you may never develop symptoms. And this is the hardest part. You know, you go for 14 days, feel totally normal. You haven't exercised, so that makes you feel like crap. And you never develop symptoms. But what we found is that even asymptomatic people have had inflammation throughout their entire body. We found inflammation in the heart. Um, and so by stressing your cardiovascular system and your pulmonary system during that time, you're putting yourself at risk for further complications down the road because um, you may actually be having some internal symptoms of the coronavirus without ever experiencing the external symptoms. That's, that's awesome. And thank you for clarifying. And thank you all for keeping the chat going. We have some really great conversations <laughs> happening there and discussions that will be extended into our Q&A after Dr. Ahmad's talk. Dr. Ahmad, our, um, I glitched out there for a second. He is our chief of sports medicine at Columbia Orthopedics. And he is also uh, the New York Yankees uh, physician, chief medical officer for Major League Baseball, New York City Football Club's uh, head team physician. And he's, he's a great friend and a great colleague. Uh, and he'll shed some light on experience at those levels and how that can transcend to our levels of community sports and collegiate sports and how we can practically deal with some of the complications of return to play. So thank you so much for taking the time, Dr. Ahmad. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar. Tom asked me to speak about the pearls and pitfalls of COVID as it relates to professional sports, especially with my relationship with the New York Yankees and the New York City Football Club. Here are my disclosures. First, we previously discussed the model for safe return to play. And in that model, there were issues how we managed infection transmission risk, the resources for that management, and we also had local national government mandates that allowed us to do things such as get back to group activities or not. The return to training plan, therefore, was a number of phases. And this modeled what we were doing with the New York City Football Club. 
phase one was individual field access only. That means a single player could get on the field at NYCFC training facility and practice by themselves or with observation from a coach. Then it would build up to more players, which is phase two. And then phase three, of course, would be traditional phases. Phase one, symptoms needed to be monitored and surveilled. So you were not allowed to train if you had symptoms or close contact with anyone who was sick, or if you personally had risk factors, such as a coach, age over 65, some level of health compromise, such as immune suppression. And there was frequent temp. And so the phase one protocol also observed social distancing and hygiene. That meant from a practical aspect, players would arrive and leave in a staggered fashion that had to be organized. They wore a mask in the training facility, they washed hands and used gloves, and the number of players allowed to train was dictated by the size of your facility. Big facility for some clubs, more players, smaller facility, less players at any given time. And there was restrictions, no ball passing from one player to another. Coaches had to observe with social distance and a mask and there was equipment sanitized every pra after every practice. Training, there was small group training, monitoring of symptoms and signs again, but COVID testing was implemented with the PCR, which is the nasal swab, and there was also antibody testing. And at the time that this was being developed, there was an ideal that all players and staff could be tested on a very regular basis. Timing, frequency, and availability was subject to the amount of resource available and also paying attention to public health and government guidelines. And there is also this new issue of cardiac issues that we learned from COVID. And you already heard from Dr. Engel today that the cardiac issues are important to manage as he's discussed. And why is this important for the professional athletes, NYCFC or the Yankees? It's because in some ways, professional sports with mass amount of resource can serve in some ways to guide collegiate sports, high school sports. And the MLB approach to COVID was first, get a team of experts, get everybody involved who knows about COVID and MLB leadership and get them put on task for designing protocols, communicating those protocols, working out the action steps to develop real play. And then there were the issues of the unexpected or maybe even consequences. So the team of experts were MLB leadership, including the commissioner himself. And there was independent infectious disease consultants who were brought on and the Medical Advisory Committee, which consists of a number of MLB team physicians and athletic trainers who serve to guide the commissioner's office, which I participate in. The design of protocols emphasized all the features of COVID, which is social distancing, sanitization, surveillance of symptoms, periodic sequential testing, mask wearing, and even game modifications, how we can reduce risk, such as how double headers were reduced to seven innings, how to manage extra innings by decreasing the length of extra innings, starting with a player, a base runner application had to take effect. A 78 page document was crafted by MLB leadership. There was numerous conference calls, memos, individual calls to individual clubs to make sure the communication of all of this very detailed protocol could be followed and safely and accurately, which gets to our action steps. What is the response to a positive test, the necessary quarantining, cardiac testing, and even game postponement if a number of players tested positive? Those were all put into and now something that's just becoming more obvious are the unexpected and expected. Nick Dansker, my current fellow, took on this project to study the impact of reduced and irregular spring season training on the incidence of injury amongst 
MLB baseball during the COVID-19. Why was this an important study? Well, MLB did everything they could to mitigate risk for COVID. They shortened spring training. They decreased the season to 60 games. They decreased the amount of travel so East Coast teams did not play West Coast teams. And they started on July 1st with a spring training at their home stadiums with three weeks of exhibition games before the regular season started. But this shortened preseason and perhaps even deconditioning leading up to the season could be a risk of it. So this study's purpose was to report the epidemiology of injuries amongst MLB players for the first 30 days of the 2020 season with COVID and compare to prior seasons. We use public databases. The first 30 days of 2018 and 19 were compared to 2020. And we looked at injuries that required, and here are the results. For the first 30 days, the total injuries in 2018 was 170, 2019, 164, and then it jumped in 2020 to 185. And this is despite less games played in the first 30 days. As you can see in 2018, it was 393, 2019, 398. Less games of 377 in 2020. And when we look at position players individually, the number of injuries actually went down. 2018, it was 80. 2020, it was 69. Let's look at pitchers. The injuries went up. Very similar in 2018, 90 injuries, 2019, 93, but a big jump to 116 injuries for our current 2020 days. This is what it looks like in a graph. All players are in blue, and you can see a slight increase in 2020 to the right. When you look at orange, which are the pitchers themselves, there was an increase up to that 116 and you can see the decrease in the position players that are. And then importantly, it was certain injury types. Pitchers get upper extremity injuries, shoulder and elbow. So upper extremity in blue was shown to increase in 2020 on the right, whereas the other injuries did not have significant. So how do we explain this? Well. Prior research indicates that there's a higher incidence of injury in general in the first months of baseball. This is true of other sports. There's also data from the 2011 NFL season with the NFL lockout that year. And what was observed was on average, approximately eight Achilles tendon ruptures occurred per NFL season, including preseason pre for the entire season, eight a year. In 2011, there was 12 Achilles tendon ruptures in the first 30 days. A big dramatic jump in these tendon injuries. And we know there's a relationship between training load and injury rates amongst professional athletes. This is true in our literature. And so this highlights the importance of structured preseason training and conditioning. And this is something that we should learn from and keep in mind, especially with our collegiate athletes and our high school athletes recreational athletes who are going to is this expected or unexpected this injury risk i have been taking research that i normally would present at medical meetings to other surgeons who are involved in sports medicine and i've been crafting them to educate the biggest and most important group of people who impact our young athletes that's parents and coaches so I've been writing some blogs. Here's a blog that I wrote in May, the challenge of Tommy John rehab during the coronavirus. And it explained that those athletes who had already gone Tommy John surgery, now that had to social quarantine, were under an extreme challenge for rehab. And then another blog was, how is it possible that I tore my UCL during the coronavirus? I was doing telehealth with patients who were getting MRI scans and they were tearing their ligament. And I explained how that was. I even wrote about the experience of working in the ER, dealing with coronavirus, and I was able to virtually attend the Columbia University's graduation ceremonies for their varsity athletes 
which I was fortunate enough to be a varsity athlete and celebrating my 30th year anniversary uh, reunion. And I wrote an article on what varsity sports was like 30 years ago and compared to what it was like today in the Senate. And then finally, this blog, could COVID-19 worsen the Tommy John epidemic? I wrote in May of 2020. It got picked up as the, by the media saying that I was ready to predict Tommy John surgeries increasing and all kinds of articles, including this one in the New York Post that the Yankees doctor warns MLB restart may bring Tommy John surgery. So if you're interested in this type of material, these are other blogs not related to COVID that is available for anybody who's interested. And if you would like to receive such blogs, just email me at csa4 at columbia.edu and I will get you on the mailing list. You can take a look at them also at my Let's go over finally as I, uh, I'm about to end, what it's like for Yankee games and NYCFC. This is the Legends dining area where normally it's filled with fans. This is where the players have their pregame and postgame meal, all at tables that are distanced from each other. I'm doing a little computer work here while the game has just started and the players are out on the field. This is what the field looks like. I took a walk and there obviously are no fans. The only people around the stadium in the seats are actually photographers. And these are the tunnels. This is the direction to the opposing team's clubhouse. I met one of the players from the Boston Red Sox who happens to be a patient of mine. And I caught up with him and did a brief exam and checked him out in one of the tunnels. And usually this is filled with security. You can see that it's completely absent and processed by the NLS. Very similar protocols with everything we discussed from symptom surveillance, monitoring, testing, with PCR and antibodies. And of course, there's been some injuries in soccer, but not the same effect as we've seen in our. Pictures. So I look forward to hearing from you. Good luck. Thanks, Chris, for that informative talk. And, and those uh, photos of the stadium are, are certainly haunting, having been there several times covering events. Uh, it, it is nothing like that in a pre-pandemic era. The, the, the hallways and tunnels and obviously the stands are crowded and it's, it's a very different feel. So kind of eerie for all of us during this pandemic. And uh, hopefully we'll be recovering from this soon and uh, we'll be able to move on to, to happier times. But some great questions in the chat function and now it's time for some Q&A. Uh, so I collated a bunch of questions that we had in the chat. And um, the, the practical and pragmatic approach to this thing is, is, is evolving. And uh, the return to school, return to play, testing, screening um, question, uh, I'm going to turn that to Andrea. And, and hopefully we'll be able to get you some resources that will, not hopefully, we will get you some resources that you can use. But Andrea, as far as uh, screening questions for COVID, are there resources available for people so that they can have that green check mark when they're walking into the facility, walking into the building, knowing that they've answered the CDC recommended COVID questions before they participate in practice or school? Yes, um, I believe it's actually on the CDC website. Um, they give a list of symptoms that they would like yes or no's to along with have you traveled um, to anywhere that um, is basically have a, has a high rate of infection um, and then also asks for a temperature. Um, I do believe it's on the CDC website, but we will um, find that. Excellent, excellent. So we'll put that in, in our, our post meeting uh, notes as well. Uh, Dr. Engel, the two questions that maybe we'll tie in together. One is an excellent question with Eric is a case presentation, 14 year old who had no prior positive COVID uh, infection history, but then during exercise reported some chest pain and shortness of breath with a heart rate in the 140s as measured with the Cardia device. And, and with personal experience with that device, there can be some, some uh, question as to whether or not it's indicated in pediatric patients, which hopefully you'll speak to as well. But the uh, concern was uh, some flipped T waves 
And then upon evaluation with the cardiologist, the T waves return to normal with a 12 lead ECG. So maybe you could speak to the use of Cardia as a screening tool, but also uh, is there a transient change in ECG during an active myocarditis? Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, e ECG abnormalities are definitely a, a prominent feature of active myocarditis. Uh, you know, and it's usually repolarization abnormalities such as those ST depressions and T wave inversions. Um, symptoms, I think, are probably the most important thing when you're when you're thinking about an athlete's heart. So it's unusual for any athlete to have an exercise triggered symptom. You know, activities they've always been doing, and we we should always take you know new symptoms. Uh, like chest pain or unusual levels of shortness of breath or exercise triggered palpitations, you know, very seriously, especially in this sort of new post COVID, you know, heightened awareness period. So if there are, I, I actually, I wouldn't put that much stock in, in what you're seeing on the, on the cardia, you know, one lead or a three lead monitor, uh, you know, during exercise, because I don't, you know, trust necessarily the the fidelity of the of the signal, but if there's a question of an abnormality, and certainly in the presence of symptoms, you know, the first thing that that should be done is an ultrasound of the heart, and a treadmill test, uh, to look you know to get much much more accurate assessments of ST depressions or T wave inversions during exercise, and again low threshold you know for pursuing an MRI. In, in the uh, presence of any abnormal, you know, abnormal test results or questionable test results, um, but again, symptoms are one of the main, you, you know, diagnostic components of myocarditis. Uh, probably more than just you know, an MRI that's done, you know, out of context. So yeah, I, I would certainly, you know, have that 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 teenager evaluated. Yeah, and clinical and judgment can't be thrown out the rather. window, right, uh, Dr. Engel? So we, in, in our clinical practices pre-COVID, clinical judgment determines our testing, and we're certainly not just going to throw screening tests around without some, some rationale. So I think that speaks to a few of the other questions that were coming through in terms of, you know, who should be tested and what can we do with the tests? And from a practical perspective, is insurance covering cardiac screening post-COVID viral uh, infection? And so uh, our experience so far has been that if clinically indicated, the insurance is going to cover testing. If not clinically indicated, of course, insurance has historically not paid for screening tests with, without any clinical uh, reason for, for ordering them. So, uh, so thanks for that. That's very helpful. Um, so myocarditis is a big concern uh, from, from, from that MRI study, but we're learning that the actual incidence is, is very low as our prior experience, just that we have right. a pandemic on our hands where so many thousands of people, millions of people now right. have been infected yeah. with this, with this uh, disease. Yeah, as I mentioned, there's active data collection ongoing and uh, for busy sports cardiologists, again, like myself and many from around the country, we're, we're fortunately seeing a very low incidence of you know, abnormal test results you know, after that initial screening. And we are allowing you know, people to, to go back to play after recovery from COVID-19. Excellent. Dr. Busco, in terms of the return to play progression, I think Dr. Ahmad was alluding to this you know, in talking about Tommy John surgery, et cetera, and the, the idea of deconditioning leading to a greater incidence of injury. We've seen a lot of that in clinical practice over the past two months with our athletes who have returned to play and, and didn't necessarily have the same ramp up period or because of the extended rest period uh, were significantly deconditioned. So lots of overuse injuries and acute tendon ruptures, et cetera, ligament injuries. So with, with return to play, the, the question theme that seems to be uh, repeating itself in the chat is what can we do uh, immediately following uh, a COVID infection or with an asymptomatic screen. So I'm going to separate that into two questions. So if somebody is an asymptomatic screening test positive, would you allow that person to do some exercise and what limitations would you put on that? And then question number two is, is somebody's recovered from uh, a COVID infection, three different levels, mild, moderate, severe. Um, what would you do early before that 14 day waiting period for your cardiac clearance? 
what would you allow them to do in that period if they had recovered from a mild, moderate, severe infection? Those three different, um, so it's really four questions, those three different levels. Right, so I think the most important is recognizing that initial two weeks that we need to have you know, two weeks of being symptom free where you're sure that you're kind of out of the woods with the acute infection. Um, and then we're thinking about, okay, now I feel like I'm back to baseline, but how am I going to do as I attempt exercise? And for some people, you know, they'll, they'll go out, you know, they're not consulting with a physician, they had COVID, they'll go out, they'll try to run, and they'll feel normal. And I'm sure that they've just kind of gotten right back into activity, and they, they probably did not have any problems with that. Um, I think the safest thing to do, though, because what we're finding is that even people with mild, very mild infection, you know, somebody who said, I really thought I was just hung over for a day. It turns out it was COVID. And, you know, I, you know, I took a week or two, didn't do too much because I wasn't sure if it was going to get worse. And now um, what do I do? And so even those people have, you know, anecdotally, we've found, had friends and patients who have said, you know, even three weeks later, even though I only had a day of feeling unwell, I can't really go for a run. And, you know, what's going on? My whole body feels weak. My, I don't feel like I'm kind of short of breath. And so, um, that's not abnormal and we need our athletes to recognize that um, yes we're most athletes are competitive and usually you want to push yourself but this is not the time to do that and so for everyone it's different if you if you try to run and you're short of breath or you're feeling weak you know maybe that's the the time you say well let me get on you know a bike machine or something that's a little bit less strenuous than a run where my heart rate's not going to get so high and I try to get just a much more mild form of exercise and and that's going to be you know, I'm throwing out random numbers, but day one, start with five minutes, you know, see how you do, make sure you don't feel short of breath afterward. Um, you know, if you tolerate that, the next day you increase that a few minutes, um, or you lift some, you know, light weights at home. If you're someone who's used to lifting heavy weights in the gym, you're not going to go back to, to doing those heavy weights. Maybe start with resistance bands and something a little bit lighter uh, to be sure that you're you're, you're tolerating that. So I think that you don't need to wear a heart rate monitor necessarily. I put up those heart rate zones, but you certainly don't need to wear a heart rate monitor if you have an, kind of an understanding of how, how you're feeling and, and how much you feel like you're subjectively pushing yourself. Um, now, I think it's, it's definitely a little different if you've been somebody who's been hospitalized and certainly ventilated. Um, and we, we know high level athletes. I know, you know, Ironman triathletes who, can do an Ironman in nine hours, no medical problems, who ended up on a ventilator. And, um, you know, four weeks out from being hospitalized, they thought, well, I'm ready to go. It's been four weeks of not doing much. Let's get back. And uh, they're, they're definitely, you know, finding some residual issues with, with some shortness of breath and just total deconditioning. And so I think that if you've had an, a, a serious, serious infection, that's something you really do want to be consulting with a physician and taking it much more slowly as, as I imagine the risk of kind of cardiac inflammation and pulmonary inflammation is much higher. Um, so I think, you know, those, those cases will be individualized and it's hard to say, but big picture, listening to the body, really gradual progression back uh, to avoid not only the, the serious complications, but the musculoskeletal injuries. Yeah, that's, that's such a great answer, Morgan. And, and thank you. It's concise and to the point and usable information you know, anytime you can have an athletic trainer oversee a progression, I would prefer having some medical professional overseeing that, that progression of exertion, especially in our athletes. And, and we're very fortunate in New Jersey and in some of our schools and, and uh, facilities in New York, uh, athletic clubs and, and so on, the hitmen, and we have athletic trainers there and they do oversee uh, this progression. And we have some remote overseeing of progression in the early stages as well to help guide athletes. But one of our, our great you know, tools is the symptom journal. You know, keeping an activity slash symptom journal, I must say this 20 times a day, right, Andrea? And uh, maybe more. The idea that you're keep keeping that inventory because our memories are not as clear as we'd like them to be sometimes of what's actually happening during the progression. Um, so if you think about what Morgan said before about the surface area of, of the alveoli and, and how much uh, work it is for your body to rebuild that structure after a pneumonia, because this is a, a, is a respiratory virus that does attach itself uh, into, to that uh, endothelium. We have that experience in sports medicine from prior infections, not just COVID infections. An athlete who is recovering from pneumonia, it's, it's quite a struggle. It's, a, it's an uphill battle to get back that conditioning. It's not just a, a, an on-off switch. You really have to progress mindfully. And that's the concept of, of keeping a journal and, and, and uh, working with a medical professional in the return to play. 
I think that's a decent segue um, to a question uh, for Dr. Engel about, uh, it's really two questions. One, if you have a recovered athlete who has an athletic finding on ECG, in other words, we know that the athletic ECG is different than a non-athlete's heart. And we've, we've worked with, with protocols. Uh, the, the, the guys in Seattle helped to develop some of these protocols in terms of what does the athlete's ECG look like and what do we do with some of these findings that we just are sort of ubiquitous in, in a well-trained athlete. Are those findings any different when you see the athlete's heart post-COVID infection? Is there anything that would raise your your level of suspicion, even though it looks like a typical athlete's heart uh, ECG post-COVID infection. And, and the second question to follow and tie with that is, should we be screening non-athletes post-COVID infection for cardiac disease, or should we just be using standard clinical judgment there? All right, so to, to go over the question about, about ECGs, you know, while we recognize that's not always the case, if you ever have a an old ECG to compare with, you know, that's exceptionally helpful uh, because then you look for a pre-COVID and a post-COVID, you know, tracing and see if, there, if there's any, any difference. Um, we use the international criteria um, to, you know, distinguish normal training-related, you know, ECG findings, borderline findings, and abnormal ECG findings in athletes to help sort of classify an ECG as normal or abnormal. Um, so again, being familiar with the international uh, criteria or international recommendations for ECG interpretation in athletes is essential, you know, you, you know for looking at an athlete, especially in this setting. Um, things that you know, would be particularly concerning about potential myocarditis is really repolarization abnormalities. ST depression, uh, which is always abnormal in an athlete, as well as T-wave inversions in more than two consecutive leads, especially if they, the T-wave inversions extend beyond V3. So T-wave inversions that involve leads V4, V5, V6, or the inferior leads, uh, those just in general uh, require further evaluation, but especially uh, in this setting, if they're new, um, you know, could, could raise concern for potential myocarditis. Um, what our observations have been is that the ECG is probably the least useful uh, test in, in detecting myocarditis. One, because it's so nonspecific and many many cases that we've seen where there's an abnormal troponin, abnormal echo, or even an abnormal MRI, the ECG wasn't very revealing. So, um, you know, I think the same principles apply for athlete ECG interpretation now as they, as they always have. But my concern would be ST depressions or T-wave inversions. Um, the question about should we be screening everyone, um, I think the answer is no. I think you know we get particularly concerned about athletes because athletes push themselves physically and they, there's more demand on the heart. And exercise is a known trigger of a cardiac arrhythmia for people with, with myocarditis. So exercise actually makes the disease worse. And exercise in the early stages can accelerate the inflammation process in the heart. And, and people were asking like, why is there a two week window? And uh, you know, Dr. Busco went over many things which, which are very important, but also specifically for myocarditis, if it's a new test, if the virus you know, is still you know, in the system, if there's still inflammation, exercise may actually accelerate the inflammation. So there's a lot of incentive again to let, let the dust settle, let everything calm down, let the immune you know, mediators subside before you start the graded return to exercise. But for non-athletes or people who aren't, you know, expected to, to, you know, push themselves physically, again, we'll know that that question, you know, have a better answer as we continue to study athletes. But my, my thought at the current time would be that, that, no, they should not require any special testing if they're not having any symptoms that are concerning. That's a great answer and I think brings to light this idea that 
you know, coronavirus, this SARS-CoV-2 virus is a novel version of a virus that causes the common cold. And, and the, the point of that is, is that it has this affinity for vasculature and, and, and heart um, through its uh, attachment to the angiotensin receptor. And, and so the idea that there's inflammation, there's some baseline inflammation in the vascular system and that we have to let the dust settle is a super important concept and I think answers a lot of the types of questions that are coming through on the chat and have been asked in our practice as to why we're doing what we're doing. This is a new virus, it's novel, our immune systems haven't seen it before and the inflammatory cascade that can ensue can be deadly. So the uh, idea of non-athletes having sort of less um, expectation, less pressure, and then guiding your clinical tests based on presentation. What's the person's history? Are they short of breath walking to the mailbox? Let's get cardiac exams. Is this somebody who's recovering in a stepwise and, and expected uh, way? Then probably ne not necessary to screen. And I think we'll know a lot more as, as we, we have said about the, 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 the people who should be screened post-infection with higher level tests. Uh, we're certainly not going to throw cardiac MRI at everybody, but we are targeting those, those key findings, the ECG, troponin, and then when needed, the graded exercise challenge. So uh, th that's a great answer, Dr. Engel, and helps us a lot. We're going to switch gears to a more practical, pragmatic type question uh, with Andrea and the wet masks. And, and you know that came up earlier in the chat function. And uh, maybe you can elucidate more uh, what the actual concern is there. And then the other question here on the chat that I think is appropriate to, uh, to dive into is, is how has your role changed since the pandemic started? What can an athletic trainer expect uh, during this time in terms of new tasks and, and how we need to, to, to organize teams and, and, uh, and so on and so forth? And, and then we'll switch gears to a, a, a question on, uh, on uh, tracing uh, with, with team exposure. So let's start with those first two masks and how has your role changed? Okay, so um, as far as masks, um, basically the recommendation is that a wet mask is not really good. Um, you should definitely change it out if it becomes wet, soiled, anything like that. So um, ideally masks stay dry. Athletes have other masks that they can swap it out with. Um, gators will definitely make it harder um, to swap out in mid-game. Um, however, the idea with the gator is, is that it's easier for them to kind of pull up under their face mask versus taking their helmet off, um, that whole thing. So um, long story short, end of the day, the face mask, if it is wet or soiled, should be changed. Um, what did so you say about uh, difficulty with breathing? That was another important point with, with the wet mask. Yeah, so um, when, a wet, when a mask becomes wet, it does become harder to breathe. Um, the it just kind of like sticks to your face a little bit more. Um, so it, on top of that, it does become harder to breathe, which another reason that masks are not recommended in the pool or anything like that. Um, and then as far as how an athletic trainer's role has changed with the pandemic, um, we gotta be more creative. Um, <laughs> we recently sent a kid back for a progression and said, all right, get him you know, in the weight room and get him on a bike and, the athletic trainer said, I don't have a weight room open. I don't have a stationary bike. It's, you know, bolted down. So what do you do? You, you know, he said, I have a sandbag. The kids walk around the track with a sandbag. Um, you know, as an athletic trainer, you have to get more creative. You obviously have to um, kind of be that person also to enforce masks and um, just enforce the rules. Um, you know, make sure coaches have their masks on and that, they're um, everyone, you know, social distancing, those kind of things. Things are staying cleaned. Kids have their own water bottles. Um, so it's becoming a little bit more, um, I'm finding that it's becoming a little bit more for athletic trainers in the sense of kind of just being there and being constant on people to make sure that we're following rules, keeping things clean um, to obviously avoid any transmission. That's that's great. I, I can tell you from from watching, uh, you know, as, as uh, working with Andrea these past few months that she's become a contact tracing expert and she's really focused a lot more on understanding how uh, diseases spread 
from an epidemiological standpoint, you know, not something that you typically think about every day as an athletic trainer, but we, we deal in sports medicine with infectious diseases. And, and so this has really just amplified that understanding. And so, it, you know, this other question in terms of what is the magic number for shutting down a team? Eric is ad- asking some excellent uh, questions tonight. Thank you, Eric. Um, the magic number is, is you have to look at exposure time and proximity and, uh, you know, we have been recommending contact tracing courses to, to really anybody. They're free. The Johns Hopkins one is, is really excellent. Not that all the rules apply in every state and every locality, but the, the ideas that, uh, that are conveyed are basically a synopsis of understanding epidemiology and how illness spreads from person to person, and specifically this particular virus. So, you know, once again, in, in a webinar format, we're, we're recommending that course and, and hopefully, um, you will take the time to, to, to understand the, uh, the, the, the need for isolation post-exposure and who needs to be isolated. And then your local health departments are going to help you coordinate the contact tracing. Um, so there, there's uh, another question here. Uh, well, it, for, for emails, uh, you, you can actually email any of us and we will get the uh, information at the end of each of our talks. There was a, an email link. Uh, ours is ortho hyphen team bots at columbia.edu, um, which I'm sure Andrew is really happy that I'm sharing in this format because now we're going to have to answer all those emails. But uh, we will get you on the mailing list. And, and uh, this is a great night. We're still over 200 active attendees asking questions. Thank you for staying engaged. We'll try to stay engaged with you as long as you're engaging with us here. Um, I'm going to answer the question about mental health and anxiety. Uh, it's, and part of my role in Columbia is I'm the di- director of wellness and uh, in, in that role, I've, I've thought a lot about mental health and well-being, and especially during this pandemic, started blogging and, and doing some video blogs and uh, actually lost my mind a little bit with that stuff for a while because it can consume you in terms of trying to engage with the public in that way. But the, the, the basic thing that I've seen both in colleagues and in our patients is a general sense of angst, uh, a general post-traumatic stress, very sort of low-level but simmering post-traumatic sort of response. And the closest thing I can think of is, is the immediate response post 9-11, how people were, you know, immediately shocked and then there was, you know, an end and people simmered down. With this, there are these little spikes of trauma that continue to uh, exacerbate people's underlying mental health concerns, depression, anxiety, et cetera, and so forth. And so there is this sort of constant annoying anxiety and depression that seems to be pervading people's lives. Couple that with constant change, change fatigue, uh, and, and the energy that goes into constantly adapting to changing guidelines in every possible arena, no matter what your occupation. And I think that people are, are ending up with, with uh, you know, an epidemic of mental health disorders. Luckily, with telehealth evolving and the, the stability of these platforms, people have access to mental health. And, and uh, you know, if you go to the Columbia website, there are tons of resources for mental health support, both for, for the general population, but also for athletes and, and others for re- really use with, for anybody who's, who's struggling that way. And most importantly, I'm gonna call attention to the Columbia Lighthouse Program and suicide prevention. Historically, medical people have been, and, and others have been hesitant to ask questions about suicide, but there are six questions you can ask, and we'll also link this in the post uh, webinar um, um, educational materials that you can ask that are related to suicide. And you you're never going to be wrong asking someone if they've had a sense of wanting to hurt themselves or in their own life. You will not trigger suicide by asking someone if they're thinking about suicide. If anything, they'll be relieved that they can talk to somebody about it because generally people end up closing themselves in before they commit suicide and they become more and more isolated from others. And then finally, God forbid that uh, uh, and this end event will, will occur. So if you find somebody in your circle, ask the questions, go to the um, Columbia website, look for Columbia Lighthouse Program, ask the six questions, they apply, they're used in our military, they're used in our hospital for our, for our faculty, uh, they're used at multiple facilities across the uh, United States in both police and fire, EMS, schools, um, and anybody can ask those questions. So from a mental health perspective, I think that we have as much a mental health epidemic as we do an actual viral epidemic. And so, um, you know, stay vigilant in that regard. And one of the things I used to teach at Seton Hall and and Andrea can attest to is is that athletic trainers specifically, physical therapists also, 
uh, physicians, we have a portal into people's lives and, and, and people will be honest with us. And sometimes you are the person they're going to talk to about their drug or alcohol problem or their, their abusive boyfriend or, or whatever the case may be. And you may not be prepared to answer those questions specifically, but you should be able to direct them to someone who can help. So uh, please use the website to find more resources and engage uh, uh, with, with your patients and loved ones who might be suffering from mental health, especially during this unbelievably stressful time. Um, <clears throat> all right, that was uh, mental health. Uh, moving on. All right, I think we're getting close to the end of questions here. Uh, and people just saying thank you. So I'm going to say thank you because our panel is excellent. Thank you, Dr. Engel. Thank you, uh, Andrea Hapley. Thank you, Dr. Morgan Busco. And thank you, Dr. Christopher Ahmad for participating. I think this was a really useful event and we'll plan on doing another to follow up maybe in a month or two as new information becomes uh, available to us. And um, please keep in touch with us. We gave you the contact information and uh, feel free to continue the conversation on social media or what have you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you.